I'm Bernhard Beckwinchatz, and my collaborator, uh, Dr. Tom Higgins, uh, he's the chair of the uh, Physical Sciences Department in, at, the, at Harold Washington College, which is one of the seven uh, city colleges of Chicago. And unfortunately, he had another conference he was already committed to, so he can't be here to present. Um, but he'll be here in spirit. And um, so um, just wanted to start by, by talking about a couple of goals that I think we, uh, most of us share, um, you know, kind of sound kind of lofty, but, but I think we, we kind of uh, all have, have these goals in mind when we work with students. You know, one goal is to increase the number of students that are participating in, in STEM. Um, and another goal is to improve the quality of the education that we were able uh, to give them. Um, and, you know, the reason we need to think about these things is because uh, that's not, uh, other countries in the world do that, and, and so for us to, to re uh, retain our, our uh, leading role in uh, STEM fields uh, in the world, you know, we have really have to think about how to improve and uh, increase participation uh, in science education. And then uh, for students who are not necessarily planning to uh, become scientists or engineers, uh, of course, we still have many issues in society that, that uh, are STEM-based. Health is the most obvious one, perhaps, but also the environment and many other issues. Um, and so many of us, and including many uh, speakers today, are involved in thinking about ways to improve um, science education, give, give uh, non-science students a real experience so that they can understand how science works and, and how scientific knowledge uh, is generated. And that's kind of what drove, what drives this project uh, that I'd like to talk to you about, these, these three, three goals. Um, and, um, oops, down is advanced, right? Um, and there are, uh, there are strategies out there. We didn't have to uh, invent new strategies for accomplishing these goals. But um, for increasing the number of, of students who participate in STEM, an obvious way to, to do that is to, to target populations who haven't. You know, there are lots of populations in, in, in our country who are not participating, and there's a lot of talent, obviously, that we're not taking advantage of. Uh, so, so targeting uh, especially minority groups and, and women is, is one of the strategies. Um, in, for improving qu the quality of STEM education, there are also several uh, you know, evidence-based strategies, and one of the ones that we all all of us, I think, believe in is, is that we want to engage uh, students in research, and especially early on during their, their career. Um, and for, for increasing scientific literacy among our students who are not uh, going to be scientists or engineers, um, one uh, strategy that, that has been demonstrated to work is to increase these kinds of I call them cookbook and tax form labs, you know, where, where the outcome is already known and the students are kind of just being taken step by step through a process by real open-ended uh, scientific investigations. And th those questions have come up in our discussions a few times already today. It's not easy to do. Um, and uh, so, uh, see, down, there we go. Uh, here's a, one very important uh, document that uh, I've read several times, and, and uh, you know, that, that uh, it's called Five High Impact Practices, uh, uh, practices that have been demonstrated to have a high impact in undergraduate education, first year seminars, learning communities, service learning, and undergraduate research is also one of them. So this is a report by the um, American Association of Colleges and Universities. Um, so. Uh, you, could, you might ask, I'm, I'm at, at, at DePaul University, which is the la largest Catholic university in the country and the eighth largest private university. So why do I talk about community colleges? And you know, there are so several things that community college, co colleges can do, to us, uh, can do for us to uh, accomplish these goals that I can't do as well at DePaul University. So one thing that, that definitely works for community colleges is that they're large. So, um, 13 million students, or about 44% of all undergraduates in the United States, are enrolled in community colleges. Uh, the second statistic I was very surprised by, um, and it comes from, a, um, from an NSF 
document, so I'm pretty sure this is correct, that 50% of recent science, engineering, and health graduates attended a community college at least for part of their education. So half, fully half of uh, uh, all professionals in these disciplines have gotten some of their education through community colleges. Uh, and then specifically for our state in Illinois, uh, the community colleges are the largest provider of public education. So uh, in Illinois, 64% uh, of all students enrolled in, in public higher education uh, are enrolled in community colleges. Uh, so it's definitely the size. Um, second uh, very important reason to work with community colleges is their diversity. So, um, oops, hi, I will learn. Uh, so 40% uh, of all students enrolled in community colleges are from underrepresented minorities. Um, and 59% receive financial aid, uh, meaning uh, many of them wouldn't be able to afford uh, higher education if it weren't for, weren't for community colleges. Um, they're also untapped. So 43% um, of all first-time freshmen in the United States are at community colleges, and 42% of first-generation college students are at community colleges. So it's, it's a great way to reach talent that hasn't been reached before working with community colleges. Um, and then finally, for you know, me being at DePaul University, community colleges are a major source of our students. So here, one statistic from last year is that 41% of new degree-seeking undergraduates at DePaul University were transfer students, meaning they got a, an associate's degree from a community college and then transferred to DePaul to get their bachelor's degree. Of course, we're not the first ones to recognize the importance of community colleges. In fact, uh, you know, in the Obama administration, uh, community college higher education has been a high priority. Here's one example. There was a summit, uh, a White House summit uh, on community colleges in 2011. And you can, uh, c came up with a number of, of recommendations and you can download this uh, for free from the White House website. And then of course, we also have uh, Kendra uh, here uh, and, uh, this is one of the articles that inspired our work as well. This is uh, an article she wrote in The Physics Teacher. This is the main publication for um, physics teachers in this country. And uh, it's called Developing Early Undergraduate Research at Two-Year Col Colleges. And she talks a lot about the challenges and how to address them. Uh, it's a really great article. So, um, Let's, let's move on to the city colleges of Chicago. Uh, so city colleges are the community colleges in, in Chicago. And um, uh, let me just give you kind of a lay of the land. So you can kind of see the, the city limits of Chicago, this, this pink line. This is what, how Google Maps draws uh, city limits. And uh, the red markers here are the city colleges. And the green markers are the uh, our satellite campuses of the city colleges. Um, and you can see they're, they're, bas they're basically distributed, covering the entire city from the far south side to the, to the north side. Um, and the two blue markers here are the two DePaul campuses. We have two large campuses, um, and we're nicely situated in the middle of all of this, which is really great for, for collaborating. And let me just show you here, the, these are, here are the the seven colleges, so Olive Harvey, Richard, well, I don't have, don't have to read all of them, but, but there are seven, seven of them plus multiple uh, satellite campuses. Uh, who are their students? So um, they're large. You know, the city colleges are by far the largest uh, community college system in Illinois, and one of the largest in the country as well, 120,000 students total enrollment. Uh, 62,000 credit uh, career students, and that corresponds to 31,000 full-time equivalents because the average is about a half uh, a part-time student who takes about half a full-time uh, course load. And uh, I also, for, just from comparison, so we're not a small university by any means, but we're completely dwarfed by uh, the city colleges. So here are these numbers in parentheses 
are the corresponding numbers for DePaul. So they're large. Um, they're much, even though DePaul prides itself for its diverse student body, uh, community, the, the city colleges are much more diverse. So 37% African American, 35% his, Hispanic uh, versus 9, and 14% at DePaul. Uh, 18, only 18% white students, about the same percentages of Asians, and then also a much higher percentage of female students, 62% versus 53%. Uh, so this shows you that if you're trying to reach students who haven't participated uh, fully in STEM disciplines, then, then working with community colleges is a great idea, or with the city colleges is a great idea. Um, of course, one major reason for having this great diversity here is uh, these numbers down here. So uh, a, a semester credit hour at the city colleges is currently $89, and a quarter credit hour at DePaul is $570. Uh, so so it's uh, much, much more affordable. Uh, and uh, it's still very high, high quality, at least based on what I've seen so far. Um, oops, there we go. So, so um, our project builds on a number of projects that have been going on in Chicago uh, and elsewhere for uh, a few years. Most import importantly, the Chicago Initiative for Research and Recruitment uh, in Undergraduate Science, or CIRIS. That's a project that uh, was funded by the National Science Foundation from 2008 to uh, this year, it ends this year. Um, and it was open to um, students from both the city colleges and from DePaul University. In fact, only two of the city colleges, Harrod Washington and Truman College. Um, and one important component was a six-week summer research uh, program. Uh, where the students, with six to eight students, worked with a fac faculty member on research. So that varied from microbiology, chemistry, uh, physics, and, and in to, uh, not to, both in 2009 and in 2013, one of these projects was about high altitude ballooning. So in 2009, the students built a scintillation based uh, cosmic ray detector. Uh, and in 2013, they measured atmospheric carbon dioxide and how it varies because of you know, plant intake and so on over the course of the day and at different, different types of weather and so on. Um, so that's a project we're def definitely borrowing a lot from, especially the summer research component. Um, Tom Higgins, my uh, collaborator from Harold Washington, was one of the leaders of the STEM Engines uh, project, which is also National Science Foundation funded uh, in their URC program. It also con uh, contain had a summer research component uh, and it was had all seven city colleges of Chicago were involved, plus three um, suburban community colleges as well. Uh, and then last but not least, um, Taylor University's HARP, uh, National Science Foundation CCLI grant. It's very, very important, first of all, because I wouldn't be doing high altitude ballooning without them. Um, and then also, um, we got funding to do a faculty development wor workshop uh, last summer. Uh, from, through this NSF grant, um, and um, you know, the, not it wasn't only the funding that we received, but but Don, both Don and Jason were extremely helpful in um, in helping us design the workshop. Uh, we tried to model it after the Taylor University faculty workshops, which I participated in one of those as well. And uh, uh, we also got some additional resources, materials that uh, that we could use during the workshop. And uh, you know, Jason is just great in helping. He's done this so many times, so, so he was able. Like the one thing I'll never forget is, is uh, you know, I was thinking about all these things I wanted to teach in the workshop, and he said, no, 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 no. It's only three things you have to teach. Uh, and one is students love it. Uh, two, it works. And three, you can do it. That, that's all. So, so uh, and I kind of. Uh, took that to heart and I did that and it's really true you know over, uh, I don't know if you've if you've tried to teach how to do ballooning to someone people can easily get overwhelmed because there are so many little details you know and each one of them you can screw up and, and it could have disastrous consequences so so if you focus too much on those details before someone really uh, you know is comfortable with the with the overall idea and is convinced that this is something they want to try uh, it can be overwhelming 
Uh, and so we really try to focus on, on the simplicity of it and the fact that it works and, and that they can learn it very quickly and that the students love it. And that's by far, to me, the most important part of it. Um, so here are just some pictures. Uh, from, so we had uh, partic participants from all seven city colleges, faculty from all seven city colleges. And uh, here are some w uh, pictures from one of our flights. We were able to do a double launch because my colleague, Mark Potasnik, who was here last, uh, last year at the conference, uh, has, has an ongoing carbon dioxide program. So we were, co were coordinated. And that was a lot of fun because he uses 200 gram balloons. <laughs> And we launched a 1,500 gram balloons. And as you know, they have very different flight profiles, especially in the summer when the you know, 200 gram balloon will go one direction normally. And the, the 1,500 gram balloon at about 65,000 feet will turn around. And so it was, it was a lot of fun for the faculty not just to launch both balloons, but also to track them and try to recover them you know, and, and kind of observe in real time how, how the flight paths were so, so different. Uh, so there was a lot of excitement uh, that came out of these flights. And uh, there's a few more pictures. Uh, here, here was the first flight, August 16, 2013. And, and you can see there are two, two, uh, traje two flight trajectories, the one for the 200, one for the 1500 gram balloon. You can also see our, our chase vehicle uh, trying to find it. Uh, and a picture from one of the payloads that uh, the faculty constructed, uh, showing a temperature sensor sticking into the picture as well. Uh, and here's the second flight in September of last year. And uh, this was uh, a picture ta uh, taken with a Canon Hackers development kit where the, we just caught the, the burst of the balloon. And, and this was a project that one of the math faculty from Truman College did. He wanted to model the expansion of the balloon. And so he used these still pictures uh, to do that. Uh, the first flight was uh, just for faculty, and in the second flight, we, we, uh, we invited them to bring their students, which was also great because um, you know, it was, was nice for the faculty to see how engaging it is for their students, and they could really see themselves do this kind of thing because uh, they were able to bring their students. This is a short video. I think we have to do Angela's kinesthetic because see what happens is, uh, I think, it's not a big deal. Though. I don't know why that. <laughs> But it's going sideways. So that, Almost perfect. Perfect. Wow. Perfect, yes. So that was uh, a video that one of the uh, community college chase teams uh, recorded of the landing. Um, and so then, you know, I wasn't really sure if this would go anywhere. You know, I'd n I didn't have any experience. I'd participated myself in faculty development workshops, but I'd never done one myself. Uh, but there was a lot of excitement about continuing this work. And, and uh, so Tom Higgins, my uh, co-presenter here, uh, formed what he called a leadership team, uh, with, which had both uh, faculty, so he himself, uh, Vinay Dugal, a math faculty member, and uh, Christine Agulia, a communication faculty member, and, and myself, plus uh, Mike Davis, who is the interim vice president at one of the colleges. Uh, and the, the original plan was just to think about how could we continue to do like small projects, uh, for example, you know, having uh, supporting a faculty member to integrate some ballooning into an existing course and, and things like that. Um, and then, but then uh, we heard about an opportunity through Space Grant. Uh, so Space Grant does these uh, national competitions, and uh, last year or th this year actually, it was about engaging community colleges. Uh, and maybe some of you have also submitted uh, proposals for that. And, and so we decided to do a much larger project. We talked to our space grant director, and he was very excited about it. And uh, so here's kind of the components that we were planning to uh, do uh, if, if our proposal gets funded. So um, one is uh, three to four week classroom modules um, for uh, general education courses for non-science majors that kind of focus on some of the things we already talked about today, the scientific method, uh, perhaps using data from previous flights, doing their own launches and things like that. Um, then a summer research component, which uh, we will model after the Cirrus program. Uh, so we'll have six to eight students uh, working with a faculty member on an HAB uh, project. Uh, there'd be competitive recruitment. Um, then a, uh, an academic year. Uh, research and outreach component, also for science majors. 
which, where the, which would allow them to continue their summer research, um, help their faculty members, who will also be teaching these courses for non-science majors, with the module development, and then also do some outreach to a grade 6 through 12 through the uh, Malcolm X Saturday Academy, which is a uh, very successful uh, project at Malcolm X College that involves uh, students from grades 6 through uh, 12. And uh, uh, so, so that, that's a very exciting component as well. Uh, and then finally, we'd al we also want to do some more faculty development. So there would be seven to nine core faculty members in this project who would um, you know, work on the summer research with the students and teach the courses. But then we also want to expand that to, to their colleagues at the city colleges, as well as to suburban community colleges, um, and uh, to also to downstate community colleges. University of Illinois used to have a ballooning program that's dormant at the moment, but they want to revive that and so that we would also do some workshops uh, there. Uh, so that's hopefully what we'll, we'll do. It's very competitive program, but we submitted our proposal to last month. is very competitive, but it's also a very modular idea. So we, like I said, we started at a much smaller scale, and uh, so we, we can do individual pieces of this, even if we don't get the, the large grant. Uh, but um, anyway, so th this is uh, just a little bit of, of what we've been doing last year and what we're planning to do. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you have any questions about this or any, uh, Kendra, any suggestions uh, from your own experience? I think we have a little bit of time. Yeah. Some time yeah. Questions. Go ahead. yeah, Bernhard, on the previous slide here um, about the classroom research module, and I, I see that the focus, yes, is on the scientific method, but here's one of my concerns. Are you teaching content? as well as method, and are you assessing that once the students leave the modules, they, for example, they understand the distinction between the troposphere and the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. They understand the distinction between cirrus clouds and stratus mm -hmm. clouds. Are they actually walking away with content that, that really is, is missing from so many of our students? Or are they just walking, well, wow, I had a good time, and yeah. You know, maybe I know a little bit more about the research method, but the, the content's missing. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know exactly what you mean. You know, there, there is a risk that the, the process of launching a balloon is so exciting and having these videos and so on, you know, that, that uh, you know, that's actually, uh, Angela, uh, that's one of the things I was really excited about in your project is that you're kind of highlighting the, those secondary payloads as well. So it's not just about the live video, but it's, it's about thinking about ways to, to actually teach uh, content um, and uh, yeah, I mean uh, th these modules don't exist yet. You know, they'll be uh, developed by the f by the seven to nine core faculty in this project. Uh, so I, I hope. All I can say is I hope so. <laughs> and I, as far if I can help it for sure, you know. But it is definitely, and I'm sure you've all had some experience with this. You know, it's kind of easy to do a, a balloon flight and say we've done science, but but what what the students really learn from it. Uh, so that's that's a you know a kind of a core question that that uh, we always have to keep in mind. Can I just add something then? If if your key learning objective is a scientific method, and you do a great job of teaching them the scientific method, then I would say that it's it, it's successful. I mean, if that's what your goal is. Now your yeah. goal was to have other learning outcomes, yeah. and you didn't meet that, then. Yeah, that would be yeah. a concern. But. And, and I think the idea is that these would be integrated into existing courses that have their own set of learning outcomes. Uh, but these are courses for non-science majors as well. So what's always important in my own, you know, I teach these every year, uh, ballooning courses for non-science majors. And, and to me, more important than uh, specific content is to give them a, a, a real experience, you know, that includes uh, asking a question, doing background research, developing a hypothesis, uh, carrying out the, uh, constructing the experiment, and then analyzing the data. And, and um, so that, that's pro probably why I put this here, you know, because I think for students who are not going to be sci scientists, that's for me maybe the most important thing to, so, so they really don't just read the book, but, but they have some, some experience they can refer back to when, when they read about uh, scientific discoveries. Any other questions? Oh, 
Yeah. Have you found some experiments that work better for non-science majors than others? Or? Um, you know, tomorrow I'll talk about biology experiments, you know, which that was always my struggle. Um, for both my, my K-12 outreach projects and the non-science majors in college, there's so much interest in life science experiments. And, you know, <laughs> oftentimes this was just, okay, so can we build something that allows these crickets to survive, you know, and, and there wasn't any real meaningful learning. And so finally, I started working with colleagues in, in uh, biology and environmental science. And uh, so, so uh, I, I think, you know, I always try to, to allow students to come up with their own ideas uh, and support them as much as I can. So in my last course that just ended, uh, students wanted to fly their own blood and, you know, see what happens to those blood cells. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, try to make that happen, but unfortunately you, you can't, you know, it's a biohazard. So, so we ended up flying sheep's blood. Uh, you know, and, the, and, and what, what that does, if you, if you can find a way to support students, it gets them really excited about it. It's their project. So I, you know, I don't have a, a portfolio of projects, um, but I, I ask them, okay, you know, what, what would you be interested in, you know? And then oftentimes they're crazy ideas, you know, go, flying goldfish or mice or whatever, and, <laughs> and uh, things that, that are either not legal to do or, or, or I mean, you know, IRB problems and so on. Um, but uh, that's how I, I always want approach it, you know. I see, I, I, I'm encouraging them to, to come up with their own questions, you know, so that they, they experience it as something that they were really interested in, in doing.